Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I am Jen Stout. I'm a journalist and I'd like to welcome you all to the 2023 Festival of Politics. This year celebrates the festival's 19th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in three days of spirited debate. Uh, I really look forward to this discussion. We've got a really good panel and hearing everyone's thoughts and views, it's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences of opinion, uh, and that we treat each other respectfully at all times. We're delighted you can join us today to participate in Is the West in Decline? It's in partnership with the Scottish Council on Global Affairs. Uh, a little bit later, I'll invite you to get involved with questions and comments if you're keen to comment now on online you can do so using the at visit scott parl account on instagram uh, and the event is being live streamed on the parliament's sp tv channel i'm very pleased to be joined today by professor tony hastrup professor peter jackson and dr matea peter professor tony hastrup is a professor of international politics at the university of sterling her research and teaching focuses on global politics, particularly contemporary practices of security and peace. Professor Peter Jackson is Chair of Global Security at the University of Glasgow. And Dr. Matea Peter is a lecturer in international relations at the University of St. Andrews, where she directs the Centre for Global Law and Governance. And she serves on the Management Committee of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs. So, there will be an opportunity, as I said, for members of the audience to put questions and views to the panel throughout the event. But I will start off by asking a few questions to each of our panellists. Uh, I'll start with you, Peter. How would you describe the West's influence on international politics today? Do you think we're seeing a decline in that influence? Has that narrative of decline actually been around longer than we might think? Oh, thank you. There are a couple of questions there, a couple of big ones. Yeah. I'll try and answer them briefly. The, the, the answer to the first question, I think, would have to be yes. The, uh, the West, if we want to think of the West as Western liberal democracies, uh, enjoyed a period of unparalleled dominance in global affairs from the end of the Cold War around 1990 until, until quite recently. But... I think quite naturally there has been uh, an emergence of other, other civilizations, partly driven by the fact that, say, in 1980, 40% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Now it's about 8%. And as more populations become more kind of, I suppose, technologically proficient and adopt uh, uh, in an era of increasing globalization, adopt new technologies, there will be, I suppose, inevitably greater participation in global life and, and, and international, in culture on an international scale, and I think that's inevitable. What I think is probably very notable is that during the Cold War, for example, the West had uh, I, uh, a sustained campaign of propaganda, uh, cultural, what you, some people might call it cultural imperialism, but their, their policy was more about trying to make sure that the advantages of liberal democratic ways of life were broadcast across the world. With the end of the Cold War, that has retreated. And we see, for example, in places like Africa, China achieving a kind of a, almost a dominant position in the, the public sphere, in shaping public attitudes, in um, propaganda. And at the moment, we see them broadcasting more or less a pro-Russian line over the war in Ukraine. And I think that's strange. Uh, now, when declinism is linked to decadence or the kind of moral societal decline, that's a different question. And it's been around a very long time. It goes back uh, in, I suppose, democratic Western culture to the early 1800s and the end of the French Revolution, uh, in particular in France, and it's been a long tradition in France where uh, one way to make uh, political headway is to denounce the state of society and say that it's in decline, that it's falling into decadence, and the usual, the, the usual frame of comparison is the, the Roman Empire 
and uh, we see this, we've seen this ever since, we see it now, practiced on the left and the right, but at the moment more, I think, on the right. And this tradition of the decline of the West is, after the First World War especially, there was a kind of a surge in publications, uh, probably not surprisingly, given the devastation of that war, predicting the decline of the West. And one of the most famous was by a man named Oswald Spengler, who was a, uh, a German center, centrist center, perhaps center right, but, but not really, who argued that civilizations rise and fall. And this is a common trope. Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee argued this as well, that every civilization reaches its peak and then falls into decadence and decline and eventually collapses or disintegrates. And Spengler argued that civilizations reach a certain point where they become complacent and comfortable and give way to introspection and self-reflection. And this is the beginning of their decline. And he argued that uh, Western European liberal civilization around about, this is 1921 he argued this, around about 2000 would reach a period of almost emergency, which he called Caesari Caesarism, where uh, strong men would emerge and overthrow the, the constitutions of their, uh, of their states and embark on wars of conquest as a way of, uh, I suppose, alleviating or detracting attention away from the, the decline of their society and their civilization. This is, in a way, quite interesting. I don't agree with it, but uh, we do see some Caesarism around about today, and I imagine that some adherents of Spengler might, might argue that, that this, this proves that he was right. Could you give an example? <laughs> well, uh, you know, some might argue that the war in Iraq was kind of pointless for, for many people. Pointless uh, invasion and overthrow of a country on a, on, a, on, on a spurious pretext marked the beginning of a period where of escalating kind of, of, of escalating violence and the retreat of some of the international norms against state to state violence. And we're seeing, I think, some of that emanating from the Kremlin today, I would argue, this idea that it's legitimate to expand your frontiers and to launch wars on sovereign states. I think the beginning of that in our era was Iraq, where that norm was transgressed by both Britain and the United States and some of the other allies that went into Iraq with them. Yeah, I, I think the idea of international norms, international orders is quite central to this whole question. And I know, Matteo, you work a lot in conflict management and how that's changing which is really interesting. We keep coming back to the war in Ukraine, but in relation to other conflicts as well. I mean, do, in shaping the international order, how is that international order changing? And what's the role of, of the US, for instance, of US hegemony? Yeah, so one of the things um, that to me, I think it's, it's, it's a very central question, the, the big question that we're dealing with, but also sort of to the role um, of the US or sort of other Western powers is how these powers actually perceive uh, in a lot of these contexts, and I think for a while there has been this promise, sort of the, the sort of the normative transformation that we talk about, sort of the idea of liberal peace building in a lot of post-conflict societies, which just hasn't delivered um, in a lot of these contexts, right? And so because of that, in um, a lot of the environments that I work in, I work primarily in sort of the African context if the US or the West in general, and quite often by association or also the United Nations, because they're, we're part of this project, are not often now conceived, conceived of as the legitimate actor to provide sort of solutions. Uh, part of that has to do just with the credibility of the past project. Part of this has to do sort of, and I'm thinking of context such as Mali or sort of broader Western Africa, uh, where France is essentially seen as an imperial power uh, entering these contexts. So for a while, the West, the West, I'm going to use very big quotation marks on it, uh, was kind of seen as the only option in a lot of these contexts. And so countries would reach out um, to these powers to sort of align because they were dealing with um, essentially serious internal struggles. But now when there are options, they're also kind of in a situation where we either have our own solutions, we're gonna band up with sort of coalitions of neighboring countries, 
uh, in a lot of the conflicts in Western Africa, the Wagner Group is now the security provider. Uh, we're not saying that it's delivering, but it is an alternative uh, to it. And um, it is interesting. So a lot of the time, sort of in the in the media, when we follow the things, right, you, you will see the pictures of sort of the Wagner Group entering these uh, spaces. And there's obviously, from our perspective, there's a concern, um, and probably rightly <coughs> so. But you have to also think about it, right? There's a concern about the French involvement uh, in these things, and they said, and they're in a lot of cases, they're kind of like, we're tired of the West just preaching, but not delivering, and so we're open to new solutions in a lot of these conflicts mm -hmm. um, as well, which is kind of the fundamental sort of challenge to the order, which is kind of, for the first 20 years after the end of the Cold War, <coughs> the order was essentially dictated. It suited Western powers because it was dictated by the West, right? Um, and it had kind of this transformative dimension involved in it, sort of around conflict resolution, peace building, sort of state building, we're gonna build these states. Just think of Afghanistan project, uh, but when that project doesn't deliver, alternatives emerge. Um, and so that is now kind of the crux, I think, of the challenges we're seeing in, with a lot of the states fragmenting um, even further. Mm -hmm. Tony, can I ask you, within this, this conversation, what's the role of globalization? How can we, is that a useful way to, to look at this? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's useful or not useful because it is a fundamental part of the discussion, so you can't really remove it. Um, I think to sort of echo um, what has been said, it is certainly the case that I think even the discussions around um, decline in of itself, I think it should be questioned. There's that assumption, there are certain assumptions inherent in this idea of the decline of the West that is often problematic because actually the majority world is not constitutive of the countries we assume to be the West, right? Um, and also, I think that so far, a lot of what we've seen, and we see it a lot in the discourse around globalization, is um, a reinforcing of certain narratives about that we tell about ourselves that is not consistent with what we actually practice. And so we see it um, in you know, the delivery of um, the distribution of wealth globally, for example. And here we can actually see uh, commonalities within country, you know, between within countries and external to countries, right? So it might be the case that globally um, poverty um, has reduced, but where is the wealth actually? So you see a fundamental gap increasing every day within so-called Western countries, um, but also between um, Western countries and um, Global South countries. For example, this morning, the World Bank wrote a letter to Uganda saying that because um, it's recently pa um, passed a very draconian um, anti-human rights, anti-LGBTQ law, it's going to withdraw um, all support from the World Bank. Well, support is not being withdrawn from the United States in Florida, for example. Mm -hmm. So we are in a state where we do question who has actually gained from globalization, but even much more so than that, and I think that again goes back to the question is, you know, what is the West? What do we mean when we say decline? Who determines the rules of what globalization is? And I think that becomes then fundamental to sort of the recurrent crises that we see in both within countries and, and between them. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the, the war in Ukraine, inevitably. I mean, th there's a lot of discussion about what the Western response has been and how that response has differed to other parts of the world. But even within the Western response, you know, and, and it makes the, the term the West seem not useful at that point because it has been, there's been a lot of variation, say, between Germany and Lithuania, for instance. Mm. What, what does that tell us about this question? Uh, well, I think that the war in Ukraine, one of the most striking aspects of, of, of that conflict was that I think it was launched from the Kremlin. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what was in the mind of, of the Russian leadership and especially uh, Vladimir Putin, but I think it was launched with the expectation that it would be a quick conflict and that the response of the West, and in particular NATO, would be divided and slow and, and ineffectual. And of course, neither has come true. 
And on the surface, it looks as if uh, the war in Ukraine has had a galvanizing effect on the North Atlantic Alliance. And uh, that, that, you know, probably Russia is in a much worse position and is less secure, whereas most of the West might be more secure. However, if the war drags on, the worry must be that fissures will begin to appear in, in NATO and uh, in, in particular over the question of, you know, we see now a discourse in the United States, which is predates the Ukraine war, that the United States can't be involved in forever wars. And it's not fighting in Ukraine, but it's spending a lot of money to keep the war in Ukraine going. And I'm, I'm, my, my sense is that if uh, the war drags on and these discourses become stronger, and in particular, if a certain red-headed uh, Republican politician manages to get back in the White House, you could see the whole facade of the West come tumbling down and discussion of Western decline and decadence and, and uh, potential even a dissolution becoming much more prevalent. And to, to the encouragement of some of the actors in the world that are not keen on a global order, to be fair, the, the rules for which were written by the West, but a global order where great powers can't do whatever they want. I hope that answers your question, Jane. Yeah, t to an extent, I think. Yeah, we'll maybe come back to I it. Didn't, it didn't. <laughs> uh, no, we'll come back to it. I yeah, I mean the the, the idea of the galvanizing effect being on on the surface, whereas underneath is quite a lot of discontent, is is really interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of frustration in, in Ukraine that I hear about the lackluster response um, in in ammunition in, in supporting Ukraine. Do you think that's that's reasonable? Well, I understand the Ukrainian position entirely. Their view is that they are on the front line fighting for a rules-based international order sponsored by the West, but that Western nations are, have been slow to provide them with the tools with which to fight. Uh, in opposition, for example, to the United States' support of, of, of Great Britain and its allies during the Second World War, on the other hand, you know, the Ukrainians have received many billions of dollars worth of material aid, and uh, you know, without any real strings attached, at least on the, on the surface. And so, I think you can see both sides of this argument. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and there are countries like France, for example, who have actually provided quite a lot of military assistance, but have kept it quiet because they hope to be, play a role in the diplomacy of, of peacemaking uh, if the fighting ever, ever stops. So there is a, I would say that there's a lot of disagreement underneath the surface about the best solution. And because Western societies are open and they allow discontent, you see voices raised, for example, in the US Congress against support for Ukraine, less so in, in Great Britain, although the voices are there, they're just not in official circles. And uh, this is something to keep in mind as well. One of the prices for having an open, tolerant society, to the extent that we are open and tolerant, there's always, there's always uh, limits to, to society's tolerance. You have to accept that there's going to be this level of dissent and discord uh, mm. underneath the surface. Yeah, sure. The, you're talking about countries sort of positioning themselves as the, the peacemakers. And Matteo, we were talking about the fact that perhaps it's not very well known, but increasingly it's not Switzerland, for instance, that's coming in as the, as the negotiator, like the Ukrainian peace talks recently have been in Jeddah. So the interesting thing, and I think Ukraine, which just hits the news much more, and so people will follow this and this, is that in a lot of contemporary conflicts, and that goes back to my kind of earlier comment and kind of the threat that is coming um, out of it, is that we're kind of seeing decentralization or the multipolarity is also still the threaded words that we keep talking about in a lot of the spheres. And so in Ukraine, for example, you're actually seeing 
So the current, you know, so we're not saying that we're anywhere close to sort of a comprehensive peace agreement or peace deal, but the interesting initiatives and the initiatives that are being entertained by the parties uh, involved um, are actually not coming from the West, right? Which is a bit of an unusual situation, sort of considering sort of how initially, uh, sort of immediately after the, the end of the Cold War, uh, most of the initiatives, the usual mediator might have been Norway or Switzerland or some Finnish institute coming into the space, working with the parties, um, sort of designing a peace process. Right now, the only successful ceasefire, uh, ceasefire which is a grain deal, sort of the only partial grain deal, uh, deal in Ukraine has been brokered by Turkey, right? Turkey, with the help of the UN, because the UN needs to be um, at the table for the legitimacy, broader uh, legitimacy, but when that deal broke down in 2022, it was the Turkey's shadow diplomacy that actually salvaged it. So that deal is now broken, but it kind of shows that the initiatives that are coming into even a conflict that is as heated and as important for Europe, for the broader West, are coming from China, from India, from Brazil, there was just a massive uh, African delegation traveling between Kiev um, and Russia, headed by the South African president. And these were the countries that initially we were in the West unhappy with because they didn't condemn Russia, gun ho going into the thing. But they're now emerging as sort of parties that can kind of slow the debate, pause the debate for a tiny bit, and actually create a bit of a space in them. And that was the space that was previously occupied by the so-called impartial actors which tended to come from the West, right? And so it's an interesting dynamic in this. And so obviously we're seeing much more of that in Ukraine in the news, uh, but we were just chatting before is, this is a trend that is happening, for example, now in Sudan, in the Sudan conflict. Um, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, at the height of the Darfur crisis, the proposal was tabled by the so-called Troika, so that it was UK, United States, um, and Norway at the time, and they were leading the negotiations alongside the regional partners. Now this is being led by Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. right? So the, the talks are hosted by Saudi Arabia with the alliance of the US, or if you think about sort of the Iran, Saudi, Ara Saudi Arabia thawing of relations, that was not an agreement brokered. The United States can't act as a security guarantor in that conflict. China is now acting as a security guarantor. <coughs> That's and I think this is where we're seeing a rebalancing but it's also a rebalancing that we can't just kind of, with one sort of wide sweep say, this is a decline of the West. I think it just, it's a diversification in a lot of senses because the norms themselves might not be changing as much as we think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay, M yeah, a move to multipolarity as we've said. Mm -hmm. Tony, the, not just, not just the Ukraine war having huge repercussions, but also these big challenges we've had like COVID and climate change. What do you think the repercussions of these have been and how in, in the international order as well? I think actually those are two cases where you really see how um, power plays out in, in the international system and again speaks to this idea of you know what, what exactly is the West and what is the West contributing to you know our 21st century. So if you look at um, when uh, COVID happened, um, there was a massive rush to produce a vaccine, and I think I, I think I can say for all of us that we were quite pleased about that. <laughs> but one of the questions that came up was, well, you know, we were able to find a vaccine in uh, a year and a half, and yet we still haven't found one for, say, malaria, for example. All those diseases that does affect a lot more people, but mostly people who are not in the so-called West. But all well and good, now COVID's happened, we have a vaccine, so we know that it's actually possible. Um, and those who uh, sort of uh, discovered vaccine, um, it's now time to share. Well, there wasn't a lot of sharing going on. You had situations where vaccines were produced in um, non-Western countries, in India, um, in, in Russia, in China, in South Africa. Where they were produced in South Africa, um, they were exported to the West before they were given to South Africans, where they were produced in China or Russia, they weren't accepted as valid vaccines. So that you know, really um, highlights some of the divisions and some of the sort of critique of this so-called West. So in a way, I think things like COVID challenge, um, or sort of the, the responses to COVID challenge this idea of decline um, in, in, in a typical colloquial sense, and that it actually forces us to rethink what is 
so fantastic about the incline of the Two Cold War, particularly in the aftermath of um, the Cold, in the aftermath of the Cold War. Similarly, with climate change, the most impacted um, around climate uh, around climate emergency are people in the global south, and we see the material consequences of that. When we think about places like Somalia, Sudan, a lot of the conflict is being driven by the impact of climate emergency. And yet, when you have Secretary of State John Kerry say things like, well, the United States is categorically not going to pay reparations, even though it has some of the highest um, emissions, it's not going to pay reparations, he's very clear about that. It's in effect defining the boundaries of what it is that they will do when it comes to climate emergencies. In this country, we are rolling back on some of the promises that we've made about tackling the climate emergency because it, does, it just doesn't work for us right now. And yet we know, and we go to other countries and say, well, you have to do this. These are, you know, these are the conditions um, through which we're gonna um, give you money. So of course, alternatives have been sought. Now, I think it's really important um, that when alternatives are being sold, we can't think of it in a, a binary fashion that you know it's either the West or um, a certain West, China, Russia, and the other. Um, and what that means is it means that you know Africa is now pro-Russia, which is kind of the narrative that has come along with this one, one that is in parallel with the decline of the West. But rather, I would suggest that well, actually, the rest of the world is finally trying to choose for themselves, precisely because they have felt the effect of what um, vaccine apartheid looks like, precisely because they felt the, the um, effect of what it means when <coughs> the climate emergency is not being restricted. You know, even now, you have um, the United Kingdom, the United States, who is telling oil producing countries in the global south that, you know, they really need to curb their reliance on fossil fuels. But what did we do last week? So I think, I think it's really important, you know, that when, when we are asking the question around the decline of the West, we really need to question, you know, what, what is the quality of that thing that we call the West, even when we can't quite agree on its boundaries? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the examples you've given there are kind of peeling away um, to, to expose some quite rank hypocrisy, um, which, which has, you know, been going on for a very long time. Do you think, and in, in a sense, is that sort of the West reaping what they've sown in terms of people moving away, perhaps turning to, as you say, pro-Russian narratives? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think, again, I would say it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's necessarily pro-Russian narratives, they just happen to be narratives that um, perhaps align with what Russia wants in the same way that we've had historically narratives that align with what the West wants. So I think about countries like uh, Chad. For years and years and years, Chad lived under an authoritarian government. Most recently, it's been one of the countries that's also experienced a coup. But this authoritarian government could only exist because France wanted it to exist, right? And who, who was impacted by that? Chadians, not people in, in Paris. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't see it as ripping back what you saw as, as in its revenge. I think it's just as we here have alternatives every five years, we choose our alternatives. I think there is finally a space that um, is being caused by different crises like COVID, like climate change, um, like the financial crisis actually here um, globally that is allowing for those alternatives to come more to the fore and, to, and, uh, to the fore and for people to, to, to select those, even if um, the end point isn't that um, life would be all of a sudden better. After all, life hasn't necessarily been better all these years anyway. Yeah. Do, Peter, what do you think? Ooh, I think I'd push back on some of that, Tony, <laughs> because the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which poured billions of, of uh, dollars into, in investment into Africa, long predated the, the uh, COVID pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. And the building up of infrastructure and the, 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 the advance of loans has come at a price, just like Western. Yes. It's less, I suppose, overtly exploitative and extractive as Western colonialism was, but it's still, and there are, I mean, the, it, uh, Chinese, the Chinese are investing in communications infrastructure, yes. which is actually propagating 
a defense of Russian, uh, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine across Africa, across Africa, it's happening. Uh, and, and the West isn't countering it. And, uh, you know, I agree, I, I agreed with you when it came to the, you know, the vaccine hypocrisy and uh, if not hypocrisy, certainly vaccine apartheid. But uh, the one advantage I suppose is that the most effective vaccines were developed in Western liberal democracies. The Russian vaccine and the Chinese vaccine, I mean, scientifically were proven to be much less effective than, the, than, 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 than any of the, the major vaccines developed in the West. So I'm not saying three cheers for the West, I'm saying we need a balanced narrative. That the West isn't just this force of corruption and, ex and exploitation, and it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's been that in the past, certainly. And, you know, we're living in a city that was, well, well one of the major cities of the British Empire, and there's a long legacy of that as an historian. But, you know, I would say that the West has something to offer the world, and I don't know that countries in Africa are going to get a better deal in the long term from, from the Belt and Road and the Chinese. That, that, that's probably what I would argue. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because I, I have, strangely enough, was the recipient of both uh, the Sputnik vaccine when I was living in Russia and the Western vaccine, so I'm like <laughs> the guinea pig of the two. Um, <laughs> yeah, still didn't get COVID, so maybe it was fine. Um, yeah, I, Matteo, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, perhaps to sort of pick up on, on sort of, I think my, my argument in this debate, theoretic debate, would not be that necessarily what alternatives are offering, because, in, and I will often be accused of that, that I'm all of a sudden a supporter of Wagner, a supporter of China, and sort of things by exposing the hypocrisy that is coming on uh, from the West. But I think it's not kind of arguing that what is being on offer from alternative sources is necessarily going to lead to better results, but it is an alternative. Mm. And if the previous version hasn't delivered, right, countries or communities, it, shouldn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be countries, will reach out for those um, things as well. One of the things that, you know, like linked to all of these things, environmental issues, COVID and things like that, and that's the big, one of probably the biggest hypocrisies in the West is how we're dealing with refugees mm -hmm. that are a result mm -hmm. of a lot of these crises, right? Of the hypocrisy of the West. Like a lot of the times they're coming from the interventions mm -hmm. that were started by the West or at least kind of triggered mm -hmm. by the West because of sort of particular policies. Environmental issues that were largely a result of sort of past West policies that were still by far the biggest polluter, yet now we're preaching, right? Mm -hmm. But we're not dealing with kind of the consequences of it, or the consequences, we're just gonna build a very, very high wall mm -hmm. and stop all the boats, mm -hmm. right? And so it, it is kind of that narrative that, you know, I always say this, people anywhere, they're not stupid. They actually see what's going on and they're able to comprehend complexity in this. It's not that they're, you know, stupid about sort of when a Chinese investment comes in, that it's gonna come without any conditions, right? Or that there's not gonna be any payment back, uh, in sort of access to the markets or sort of getting other policies in. But they're actually able to choose now. And I think that is what, what is fundamentally changing and is kind of touching at the core of the identity of the West that we kind of need to deal with, is that we actually need to reckon with what we're doing in order to be a better provider of a lot of the things we actually can deliver in a lot of these countries. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask you, what is the future of the West? Because uh, it's not a helpful. <laughs> you can't hear very well because you're either looking that way or you're talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll speak up. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we will come to audience questions in a minute, so get ready. Um, the yeah, the, the future of it. I mean, obviously, as you say, Matea, th th those talking about refugees, that's only going to probably increase environmental problems is going to increase. This is all going to be part of what, the, let's think about the next 20 years. And, and perhaps even further, is even the term the West going to become quickly outdated? Tony, what do you think? Uh, yes, 
will it be outdated? <laughs> yes. Um, because I, I, I think that it's a fool's boundary anyway. You know, the things that make up the West um, was found in, 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 and, and built on the backs of the rest of the world. So uh, similarly, if you sort of look at, you know, the East is not necessarily that um, useful. Um, but, you know, we do use some of these concepts because it's expedient for explanation. So when we talk about the West, I know exactly what you're saying. Um, I think looking to the future, it would be, for me, it would be really useful that we start to give, um, allow agency, the agency of those people who are outside the West. Um, this, a lot of the debates I hear us having now about when we talk about balance, when we talk about Russia and West, in an area that I'm more familiar with, with Africa, is still very reminiscent, actually, of a lot of the language of the Cold War despite the fact that we say after the Cold War. And if we sort of think back to the Cold War, the, the major key threads in that debate was shaped by these two sides, right? So I think it's really um, looking to the future, be useful to sort of say that, well, actually, Africans have agency. And part of having agency is having the agency to screw up as well, having the agency to choose. So I would say back to Peter's point, um, you know, if I use the example of Niger, right, that is the latest coup. Um, in Niger, the Chinese have been somewhat involved, maybe not specifically in Niger, but around that region of Af Africa. They've invested in infrastructure like trains that are supposed to connect the whole of West Africa, the ECOWAS region. What it is in the ECOWAS, ECOWAS region, some people might not know, actually has freedom of movement. When the EU, and other Western countries decided that Niger was a, a sort of a point of departure for refugees. They intervened there, which had an impact on freedom of movement for the region, right? Intervening in how policies are made, intervening in laws within Niger. So I wouldn't, this idea that, you know, the bad things ended with colonialism and things are a bit better now. I think that it's very useful if we, when we're thinking about a lot of these big questions, that we think about the people it actually affects. I think there's a distinction, and this is where I think there will be a difference in the future, that we will, in order to, for change, for positive change to happen, we need to stop focusing so much on elites that a lot of the language that we have when we're talking about the decline of the West, when we're talking about you know, who has power, when we're talking about what is propaganda, focuses very much on the elites. I would agree, actually, that you know, people are not stupid. And if we take that very simple fact for granted, <laughs> then we will start to question, actually, um, those things that we take for granted on this side. Yes. I'm not sure we can say people aren't stupid. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Well, Honestly, not any more stupid than the, the stupid people we have here, I would say. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I just look at, and, and th there's an interesting project that combines evolutionary anthropologists and, and psychologists. And, uh, you know, one of the things that they, that has long driven concepts for uh, drivers of change amongst evolutionary anthropologists are inequality and resource scarcity. And uh, the psychologists added to this that human beings are not good at long-term thinking, generally, because what we're doing, you know, we're on the verge of uh, climate catastrophe, and we're talking about the decline of the West when it's potentially the decline of humanity. And, uh, it doesn't seem to have the urgency that it merits in our politics. We have a government that seems to be rolling back in the UK on, we have uh, one side of the political debate in the United States, which is uh, you know, overtly hostile to you know, climate change solutions. Canada, where I come from, is an energy economy and talks the talk of climate responsibility, but is actually an energy economy. And so uh, I'm not sure we can say people aren't stupid because we, tend, we seem to be sleepwalking into mm -hmm. catastrophe that we know about, mm -hmm. but we put our heads down and do nothing as a, as a species. Mm -hmm. Sorry to, for that rant, that really has 
little to do with, but... Quite depressing also. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we are going to come to questions from the audience. Uh, there's a roving mic, so please hold your hand up and keep it there until the mic gets to you and try to be succinct. Thank you. Uh, yes, women here. Thank you. Um, so kind of actually based on that context of impending uh, climate disaster, I am really interested in this question of the West um, understood as like a cultural and economic hegemony. If it's in decline and it is arguably at least in part the reason why we are where we are, is that a bad thing? Might there be better alternatives? Right. So I, mean, I, I guess personally, I, I don't like the language of decline. Um, but when I think about, for example, uh, recent changes in, say, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, where we see the impact of the United States in a recline rather than necessarily in decline, we might argue that there is some there are some positives to that. Things like focusing on climate change as disaster. Um, thinking about the sorts of knowledges that inform um, policy making. We might look at that um, as a positive. But I think importantly, what this sort of questions allows us to do is sort of um, reflect on those things that we take for granted and not necessarily throw out the baby with the bathwater, but really hold on to those things that we consider to be important. So for example, I think we can still somewhat agree that you know representative democracy it's a good thing that is something that happens a lot in you know the space that we call um the west um should it be promoted in the way that it has been in the past you know i think that there are uh, serious questions to ask about that but i wouldn't say you know we throw away some of those things that we've um uh bene we've all ben benefited so it makes the, 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 the decline, or at least the thing we call the decline, might not necessarily be a bad thing, but I think we need to make <coughs> space for some recline as well. Is it a bad thing? Uh, depends on what aspects of the West we're talking about. But I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the, the uh, World Value Survey. You ever heard of this? It's a really interesting project that was begun out of the University of Michigan in 1980, 81, something like that. And it was driven by this idea that once people become more secure, they will become more, less, uh, I suppose, more rational, uh, attribute more importance to things like education, become more individualistic and less uh, collective minded because they will be, they won't have the kind of permanent kind of uh, effects of insecurity working on them constantly and become in a way more like, more like the West. And the world's population has become overall more wealthy in the past 40 years since that survey was started. But what we found is people have become more secular generally across the world, even in places like Africa and China and, and uh, you know, where we can measure this, but they haven't become more individualistic and haven't become more attracted to kind of liberal principles in liberal representative democracy. In fact, support for this mode of organizing society has actually decreased across the world. And it's a puzzle that I think uh, political scientists, social scientists generally We'll, are, are wrestling with at the moment is why has this happened? And what does it mean about the alternatives on offer? Because, you know, China has an alternative. It's uh, a, a one-party state that gets things done. It's authoritarian, but it delivers benefits and it offers itself as a model to the rest of the world. That's one alternative. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too ignorant to, to go beyond that. Uh, and if I had to choose, I would choose, uh, I suppose, the liberal model because it's what I know. And I like to be able to express myself and say, I think that the, the current government in Westminster is a rolling catastrophe. <laughs> but, 
but but you know, China has built. I just read the incredible statistic. China has built, I think, twenty two. 220,000 or 2.2 million kilometers of railway in the past 10 years. And Great Britain has actually, its, its rail track capacity has actually decreased because no one wants people to build a railway, you know, and which is, you know, environmentally, you think about it, probably we should travel more by rail than, than in cars, but nobody wants in the UK to have a railway built in their backyard. Therefore, it's really hard to do, whereas in China, you know, the rail government just builds the railway. And that's the state does, and that's what happens. And so, you know, there are pluses and minuses in all these different models. But it is very interesting that while humanity as a whole has become more secular and less religious, uh, it's also not, it hasn't become more individualistic and more kind of liberal democratic. And uh, I don't have the answer to that, but I find it very interesting. Mm. Briefly, Matteo, yeah, do you? Just to very briefly jump, jump on. So I think it's interesting how this discussion developed, uh, that it's kind of a discussion around US versus China. Most of the world is that, right? So, and so the alternatives that I think, especially on environmental issues that I find interesting, I don't research environment, but I read the news, I sort of like follow, follow things that are emerging, are actually coming out of multilateral initiatives that don't involve the two countries. Mm -hmm. And I think in those cases, so I'm a huge proponent, those are gonna be my final remarks actually, I'm a huge proponent of multilateral institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I actually think that the institutions are corrupted, they have their own problems, right? They're bureaucratic institutions, but for a very long time they've been essentially, if you think about the UN, dictated by one agenda, they're kind of caught between the global powers and things like that, but there is space for sort of smaller powers where most of us end up living and we're currently living in a small power, right? Is that's the space where the solutions are actually gonna emerge, right? So some of the most interesting and sort of forward looking alternatives are coming from small island states, right? They band up with other countries, sort of middle, middle powers or middle small powers, right? And that kind of pushes initiatives forward. Will that be entirely transformative? Probably not in a short run, we might run out of time, but I think that is where the space for alternative sits. Not with the US, because the US has never been a leader on the environmental agenda, and not with China, right? So some of the solutions are gonna come from those circles, but the transformative space is probably coming from within. That's yeah. really interesting, thank you. Next question. Uh, yes, at the back. So um, my question sort of in two parts. Um, First of all, um, we've seen over the last sort of 30, 40 years since the end of the Cold War, sort of the, the polarization of politics more and more over time in the traditional Western, in inverted commas, states. Um, so, you know, I think that in 1997, when Tony Blair became prime minister, the differences ideologically between him and John Major were not that vast, whereas now it sort of feels like over time, the two major parties in the UK and in the US uh, are sort of separating further and further ideologically and it's much harder to get any kind of consensus. So uh, first of all, do you think that this sort of polarization is part of the reason for the, inverted commas, decline of the West? And secondly, do you think that that consensus-based politics is likely to come back or do you think that this sort of polarization is, is here to stay in the long run? Tony. Hi. Um, uh, I wouldn't agree with you that there's massive polarization, right, at least in the UK, in Westminster, between, say, our two main parties. Um, if you sort of look at um, where they think their contributions to policies. But of course, it's difficult to say because we've had one um, party in power for, what, 30 years now. I think there was an article yesterday in The Guardian by Nezrin Malik where she argued that um, actually society is not as polarized as we think it is, but rather that the political parties exploit some of the differences for whatever purposes it is that they exploit. And I, I mean, it's, I would say, you know, in my own personal experience, that's probably the case. At the same time, I think, you know, 
uh, part of what's healthy in a democracy like ours is, you know, conflict can be healthy if it's conflict that can transform for positive gain. However, what is happening, which is being exploited by um, uh, politicians, but also, I guess, aggravated by the different types of crises that we've gone through, you know, right now we're going through a contributing crisis, is that, you know, you niggle on those tiny things that we disagree on and, you, you know, you make them the big things. And I think, yes, it does contribute to um, the things that we find dissatisfactory about our lives, our lives within um, a democracy. But I wouldn't say that, you know, those divisions intrinsically, at least within, you know, the United Kingdom, have significantly broadened. Um, but perhaps that's why it's time for, um, at least at the UK level, um, thinking about you know, the actual structure of our political system. First past the post is not, um, it just feels weird for the 21st century <laughs> in a country like ours. That's the best way I can put it. So, you know, I think, you know, there are ways of sort of um, getting around those things that are being described as polarization. And I think that's where, you know, when we have this two-party state or, you know, where there's one party dominant and there can only be one sort of substantive opposition, you start to, you know, those divisions feel even bigger than they actually are because now they have to distinguish themselves mm -hmm. um, somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and the only thing I would add to that is probably the role of media and sort of what we actually click on, right? So it's basically, so I think I would agree with Tony is, and all of the research points to this is that societies are actually not as divided when we actually start asking what do you value, what do you think sort of is a fair contribution for somebody to the society, what should we do with disabled, what should we do with sort of people on sick leave, sort of things like that. Like we're actually not as divided, but what sells is divisive stories, right? And I think Jen, we can point to you, you're more of an expert on sort of the media lan lan landscape, so you yeah, should, you sh yeah, so you should actually come in, come into this uh, as, as part of the discussion. But I think that is kind of um, the discussion that is important to have. And I would stress this with Tony, like you see us here, we don't agree on things, but we can fake to them. We actually have a conflict between us on sort of some of the fundamental things on our worldviews, on sort of how we would respond to the things. But as long as you can debate them and somebody's gonna listen to you for an hour, you're now captive audience, that is a very discuss different discussion that somebody's trying to sell a newspaper where obviously a scandal or a divisive story is gonna get more clicks um, on it. So I'm not an expert on it, but you know, it's, uh, it's part of the landscape that kind of creates an image of how divided we are mm -hmm. within our societies and also between our societies. A story, so I always say this, a story on how China is bad is always gonna get more clicks on sort of how a story of how China is kind of contributing to something here, right? So and that's a, it's a bit of a question of both within and between societies. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to media, there's a the bigger problem is not political polarization, but the, the fact that many people stop believing in facts. Yep. This is a huge problem for, for society, for democracy, for, for journalists trying to, trying to write stories and have, and have people read them, but I will not abuse my position as chair to do this. Peter. No, I don't have a lot to add. I agree with everything that's been said. Okay. You know, I mean, but still, I would say that at some point we have to kind of take a stand and say, what do we believe in as a society? You know, and liberalism gets a kicking and it deserves it in a lot of ways. But the, the kind of founda foundation principle of liberalism is each person has inalienable rights. And that those rights, when it's combined with liberal democracy, one of those rights is to participate in the governance of their society. And I would stress that throwing this away is, or, or not, or failing to promote it is almost a dereliction of duty if you believe in it. Uh, and, you know, the United States is not really the best example of that at the moment. Well, and to go back to, to your question, you know, is it, it that polarization, or, or for lack of a better word, that you see in, in the United States, is this a big factor in the so-called decline of the West, or at least its lack of credibility well, increasingly? 
I, 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 I tried to allude to this at the beginning, but I don't think I did a very good job in that, you know, from the outside, someone who lives in a, a society that doesn't value freedom of expression and, and open debate might look at what's going on in the United States or wherever and say, you know, we don't want to live like that. I, I could understand that in a way. But that's one of the prices you pay, you know, to live in a society that's open and tolerant is, you know, that the uh, is that you'll have to listen also to intolerant voices and have them be part of the discussion and let people listen and make up their own minds. And in the United States, I mean, it's a it's a fractured society in many ways. But uh, and I'm 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 from Canada, and so Canadians have this weird relationship to the United States where. When we're in Canada at home, we're kind of almost very suspicious and skeptical. But when we go abroad, we tend to find ourselves defending the United States more than, than uh, that's certainly my experience and a lot of others. But it's a very, very open society. I mean, during the Cold War, there was an American Communist Party. Yeah? And, and a, a, a fantastic diversity of opinion exists well, in the United States the and activists. that can sometimes lead to being f things being fractured but it's it's almost a price worth paying I would argue okay next question please uh, one here We've talked to many uh, global events like the Saudi Arabia and Iran like the Africa investment. But, uh, however, on the position of United Kingdom and Scotland people is that the policy of Washington or the NATO has uh, limited in the UK's people in the uh, development of these people. So which means the NATO and the United States even may be caused or lead to the decline of the West. Thank you. Well, I, I, I certainly would, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll flip the, the question a bit because what I think I would agree is that a lot of the military expansionism that the West has engaged in um, is leading to the decline of the West. It's contributing to sort of the legitimacy gap that the West has um, in a lot of the, the context, right? So we mentioned Iraq, we mentioned, you know, Afghanistan to an extent, but it's also in a lot of the African countries. So Tony very nicely mentioned sort of like a couple of countries where we don't pay as much attention, but as constant security cooperation, military trainings, sort of not potentially sort of a full scale invasion of the West that just hasn't delivered for the people. And I think the securitization of a lot of the Western approaches and sort of which is accompanied by militarization is definitely leading to problems from uh, to how West is perceived outside. Um, so I would agree with that. Mm, okay. Yeah, I mean, huge changes in NATO. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I would agree with that as well. However, I think often when we're talking about uh, NATO and especially expansion East, there's this narrative that, you know, that's, that, that in of itself is the cause of the problem, um, which I don't agree with um, solely on the basis that it might be perceived as a problem by another actor, but, you know, the newer state of NATO had a right, they had the agency to choose to join any international organization that they wanted to. We could argue that the United States took advantage of it or the United Kingdom, whatever, to then you know, build um, arsenals. And I mean, I think you know, militarization broadly, globally, um, has been detrimental. And what we see now where you've got more and more conflict where increased militarization seems almost inevitable. It just means that we'll be less and less safe. Like militarization does not keep us safe. And when you look at the majority of the world, we will find that this is the case. So even if we think that we need to militarize in the short term, investments in alternatives and um, in alternative peaceable means has to be the priority. But I would say that, you know, the states, the newer member states of NATO, they were entitled for good or for bad. We might not have thought it was a good idea for them. That's fine. But they have a right to join an international organization 
as they were um, determining their future. So I think it's, it's uh, I guess, a more nuanced um, idea of, you know, uh, NATO's actual impact. That does not, of course, we know exactly what happened in, in Libya. Part of why the West is almost persona non grata as a collective has a lot to do with what happened in Libya, because what happened in Libya has had the s most significant impact on what is happening in the Sahel today. And there's a direct line, and anyone in the US State Department, Ministry of Defense will tell you that as well. Um, so, you know, these this feelings <laughs> don't just come from anywhere, but I think that we need to be able to have nuanced conversations, not binary ones around this issue. I don't really have a lot to, to, to add to that. I mean, an, w another way to put it would be, NATO has had legitimacy when it's been a defensive alliance. But when it starts to m move into Afghanistan or North, North Africa, it's lost its legitimacy and is, has, has uh, I think, uh, contributed to the erosion of, of uh, the international order that we're talking about, I think that but I, I agree that the, the idea that uh, NATO is responsible for the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is nonsensical. Mm. Completely, non absolute nonsense, you know. Mm. Seems to still carry a lot of weight, you know, with some people. Mm. I, 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 yeah, you know, I'm, because it's... I'm told it frequently. You know, it, it's a way of, it's that kind of realist idea that uh, you know, the world is permanent power balancing and as a great power, Russia has the right to control its 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 sort of frontiers and have a strategic buffer to quote Jeremy Corbyn amongst others uh, between itself and NATO. I mean that is a profoundly anti-democratic position mm -hmm. because maybe the people inhabiting the, that historic region between Russia and Europe don't want to be a buffer. Maybe they want to actually make decisions in the way that we're talking about. Uh, societies in Africa and choose their own political destiny if that's NATO fine. Mm -hmm. I was skeptical about NATO expansion in the 90s and now I have to admit I was wrong. I could be wrong now, who knows, but but uh, that's my view. No, I think that there's a lot of people have, have you know, the, the events of the last year and a half have forced quite a lot of rethinking um, around these issues around NATO and militarism and so on, mm -hmm. yeah. John, if I just may, like, so one of the things that I think it's interesting, and so I entirely agree, it's not the NATO expansion to it, but what I think potentially contributes to a lot of the, the situation is that a lot of the institutions that were essentially Cold War, sort of, they still exist, multilateral organization, I'll name two, that were intended to be kind of trust building exercises among people, countries that don't necessarily agree. Council of Europe, Right, not European Union, mm -hmm. Council of Europe, or Organization for Security or Co Cooperation in Europe, which was all about kind of promoting common values, discussing sort of security cooperation, not among the allies, not among defensive alliances, have just been hollowed out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They still exist, but neither kind of the West or Russia has been investing a lot in them. And so those are the kind of the confidence building measures that you can then have if you extend an alliance to the border of essentially somebody that considers you an enemy, sure. right? And so, it's, so that's kind of the interesting aspect is a lot of these trust building measures have just been kind of put it up. So again, a pitch for multilateralism mm -hmm. and international organizations start pressuring to, for support of these institutions, not just NATO. Yeah. Well, there was a I've partnership for peace between yes. Russia and NATO, yeah, that which existed for years. That NATO didn't take seriously at all and the yeah. Russians became disillusioned. And that was probably for me the moment where you know, Russia's move away from the West became, uh, you, can, you can trace it to that, uh, that, that moment because it was a joke and the Russians realized it was a joke. And excuse me for, for going back into history, but, but I think it's important. That was a moment where, you know, relationship between NATO and Russia might have gone in a slightly different direction and it didn't, mm -hmm. mid 90s. Another question, please. Raise your hand. Uh, yes, this woman here in the yellow jacket. <clears throat> I was just wondering where you think the role of the market and global capitalism fits into all this because, you know, there are 
multinational corporations who are making a fortune out of conflict. And it's not in their interests to promote democracy. Um, so I just wondered, you know, it's called the context of all contexts, and I think that is an interesting way to think about it. So I'd just like to hear how you factor that into your argument. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mathieu? Oh, that's a tough one. What, what have we not handled in, uh, in this panel? <laughs> I, I, think it's, I, th I think it's an underlying threat. And so I think because of that, so, so I think it was nice because I think it came out from the panel is that we have the shorthands west-east, right, or west-south. We have the shorthands where, so we keep talking about states as if China is one state. Right, so it is a state, but there's multiple interests uh, in it. And I will say one of the things that, um, and this is basically also like a reflection on sort of a lot of the academic discussions, we understand the complexity of our own societies and we kind of go and sort of think about sort of how the market is underpinning, how, you know, our Tory is this, our labor is labor this, who is supporting what, what is happening with the media, right, sort of the funding of the media. We do understand that from, our own society, but I think, so I'll just put this as a, as a sort of very brief comment that does not answer your question in any way because I think it's very complex, is I think what we need to do more is understand the complexity of sort of other areas that we tend to just paint of as China, right, or Russia, um, because I think there are kind of multiple interests playing in as, as there, and we don't tend to understand that in a lot of our uh, analysis and this is a second page support area expertise right mm -hmm. uh, we have we have basically uh, supported and I think this goes for media it goes for academia uh, the idea is to have sort of a lot of the generalists uh, people that can speak on any issue um, but I think a lot of times it's very good to have discussions on sort of area expertise which can tell you a lot about more about the political economy that is playing on in a lot of the conflicts mm -hmm. Peter Capitalism. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I'm afraid I might just be mouthing kind of stating the obvious and mouthing plati platitudes. But I mean, it depends what, which aspects of the market you're talking about. The fact that capital is so mobile now allows for the enrichment of parts of the world that were just almost unreachable, you know, up until a, 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 a few decades ago. And that is a good thing, but the fact that uh, uh, you know big money shapes democratic discourse is a very bad thing. And so I'm in general in favor of greater regulation, but I'm afraid that that greater regulation might mean that areas of the world that are benefiting from the mobility of capital will no longer benefit in the way that they are now. So that's a tricky one. And I'm, I should, we should all know more about uh, political economy than we do, but I especially should know more. Tony, can I ask you what you think on that? No, I mean, I personally don't think it's a tricky issue at all. I think we should examine uh, the function of capitalism. So for the most part, um, what is in capitalism, it has been a lot of, uh, major parts of the world feel like that's very much been defined by those countries that we call the West, for example. So it is true that there is now more wealth in a lot of regions of the world that you know we might have considered previously not wealthy, although of course that was also a fallacy given that the wealth was there, but it was just um, extracted um, in a less accountable way. So we have some sort of regulation uh, we say that we have some sort of accountability, but a lot hasn't changed that much. So I said earlier that I think we need to sort of desegregate the conversation between when we talk about elites and when we talk about ordinary people, because actually it's among the lives of ordinary people that we sort of see a lot of those crises. If we look at the UK, the UK still hasn't moved away from uh, being the, is it the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world. There is a lot of wealth in this country there's a lot of wealth in the land in this our small nation as well. But where does that wealth actually reside? Who, de who determines what um, our main products would be? It's not ordinary people. So the there's a problem with distribution. And yet the capitalist system that currently exists 
prefers it to be like that, and this is my view. And actually, there's, there's a lot of evidence for this that a lot of um, feminist political economists have done, a lot of work, for example, that the women's budget groups, uh, both um, in the UK, but also in Scotland have done, actually reflect why we should rethink the current practices of capitalism. So the world is so interdependent that I personally don't think, you know, 192 countries can say, actually, we've had it with capitalism, we're gonna turn our backs on it. And in any case, the people who have capital are quite powerful. But I think it is worth having a conversation about whether, you know, we, we know that it's not working for the majority of people, right? I mean, we do need to think about how we can work for the majority of people, but often the, the alter, you know, we don't really have a lot of alternatives from uh, elites. And when I talk about elites, I'm talking about politicians. Um, I'm talking about, for the most part, mainstream international relations, political science, academia. Um, but I'm also talking about um, even third sector. A lot of civil society organizations, charities, they don't really think about the alternatives. And so when you look at organizations, for example, like Oxfam, where we've seen in recent years, because they've gone through crises of their own, that they're trying to rethink the ways in which even Oxfam does business. And you know, this is a charity that has been concerned with poverty for years and years and years. We, you know, through their work, through the work of even smaller charities um, in our cities, we can tell that there might be alternatives. I mean, what I would like to see is the ways in which some of those alternatives can be scaled up. Um, and for me, I think part of the problem is that we're always seeking to reform something that is clearly broken rather than actually seeking alternatives. Even if we know that we cannot achieve that alternative you know, in, in 18 months. Um, so you know, I think it's a process, but we have to be willing uh, to go through that process. Um, and I think it starts from us because it is certainly the case, we know this historically, that those who have power would not want to give it up. Thank you. We have time for one, perhaps two more questions. Uh, tell me if I'm missing anyone who's had their hand up a long time, but um, yes, sorry, lady at the front, <laughs> right in front of me. Uh, I want to go back to the off-the-cuff discussion about if people are stupid or not. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was an interesting point of departure. Is it that people aren't stupid or is it the fact that democracy doesn't work? Um, so when we are voting, it's not that we're voting for something we don't know about, which is very possible, let us mention Brexit. Um, but maybe you know, what we are voting for, we don't really know what's going on. And on a larger scale, taking this now on, a, on the in, on a much larger scale, we're talking about different countries. Is it the fact that the countries, or w the smaller countries, are looking to the larger blocks for, to, to improve or for the betterment? Or is it the fact that the larger blocks are going in there for their exploitation, as always has been? And there's nothing about democracy going on there. That is my point, basically. And in fact, all the discussion that's come on since then has very much touched on that particularly what you've just spoken about now. Yeah, yeah. would you like to come back? Yeah, I mean, you'd have heard from what I said earlier, I don't like to think anybody's stupid at all. Um, um, because I think it's always relative, right? So the, the people that don't buy into what it is that we believe, we think they're stupid and therefore they're voting for um, the wrong thing. I think, you know, at a sort of basic, human level, I think what happens is people either think, well, the bad things can happen to me or uh, those I care about, so um, I'll do that. Or um, this is what I know, this is the thing that has worked for me for um, a long time, so I will go with that as well. And I mean, again, this is one of the beauties of democracy in of itself. But of course, we cannot discount, again, the role of the media, as we said earlier on, in sort of pushing certain narratives. Um, increasingly now, we, we talk about sort of, sadly, the distinctions between truth, because there seem to be multiple ones, and actual fact. And the role that, you know, fact is playing less and less of a role in the narratives that we tell about the different uh, truths. But we also know, you know, that um, recently, I would say, uh, you know, 
artificial intelligence also has a role. So thinking about you know, the role of capitalism as well, more and more com companies expanding, they're gonna make money off of it. This also has impact on our societies, on, on our communities. So I don't, you know, I don't think people are stupid. Um, they might be stupid of things that I want them to not be, but I don't think people are intrinsically stupid. I think that people um, do make uh, choices that they think work for them um, and their families. And actually, as we have more and more crises, um, the default would be to not even be able to make those rational choices. So it wouldn't even be about what stupidity or not, but actually do things out of desperation. And I think that's what we should really be concerned about, that we don't want to move sort of close and close to that edge of desperation, which is what I sort of see happening um, globally, both within our society and externally. So if I look at, uh, you know, using the Niger as an example, for, you know, um, I did not think so soon after sort of Mali and Chad that we would have another coup. Coups have never worked well in any part of the Sahel or West Africa. There are people alive in that country who know this, but from the point of desperation, mm. it made sense. Mm. You and I might sort of think having a military dictator, I grew up in a military dictatorship, I think is very stupid amongst other things. But when you're moved to the point of desperation, this seems like it actually makes sense. And actually it does, it does to some people. And I think we can't discount that. Yeah, do we, do we know what we're voting I, for? I, when democracy I said work? people are stupid, I think I was just to make a point about climate change. But I think we are programmed too often to act in a short-sighted way. And, you know, things that make us uncomfortable so we often try and filter them out. You know, I catch myself often reading something about, you know, the, 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 the possibility that the Antarctica will no longer cease, will, will cease to function as the world's kind of refrigerator. And what, I mean, and, and then I want to just turn on TV and watch a sitcom instead because it's, it makes me really uncomfortable. And I think that's what's going on you know, we don't want we don't want to be uncomfortable all the time. But if we thought about the climate, we would be uncomfortable all the time because of what we're doing to it as a, as a, as a, as a species. And that's that's what I wanted to say. We are we are programmed not to think too often. We are not programmed not to think long term as a you know as as societies, and that's a problem. I want to say one last question. Um, quickly if I can. Uh, yes, gentlemen here. Um, so we mentioned kind of the war in Ukraine earlier and kind of whatever people's views on kind of Western intervention, um, Western kind of aid giving and kind of um, also like approach to refugees, there appeared to be a kind of clear difference in how a lot of kind of quote unquote Western nations responded to Ukraine to conflicts in other parts of the world, both in terms of giving aid and resources and accepting refugees. Do you think that sort of being seen by all the other nations around the world had an impact on how the West was viewed because of almost the, the double standard there? Matthias, I'll put that to you. I, yeah, I'll, okay, the answer is yes. Uh, it's a very simp simple answer. But I also do think that what we do need to reflect, and I've just been um, looking at some of the surveys not from here, but from Ireland, right? So Ireland was one of the countries that kind of proportionally actually received quite a lot of refugees and they were known to be sort of very welcoming. They integrated, they actually provided them quite a lot of support. And we're not saying that it was perfect. Um, and the social attitudes are turning. They want them to go home, right? So I think they, there is kind of a structural racism to it, but I do also think is that even on the Ukrainian refugees, um, there is kind of the same, uh, is starting to apply as well. But yeah, the answer is just plain, simple, yes. No, I, um, I agree. Um, but I think sort of, you know, the nuance and distinction between the sort of structural racism of the government that says there, there is no structural racism um, and um, uh, folks who might feel like they're not accessing um, 
their resources because of the failure of their government, but then they sort of ascribe this to having more people in their neighborhoods. I think that there's sort of a distinction between them. The, the sort of short answer to your question is that yes, if you look at um, across the African Union, which is what, 54 countries, the thing that was very glaring was sort of, you know, the, the treatment of refugees, not the least because of what African refugees also experience at the border, trying to come into the European Union. And that plays into the calculus of voting, for example, to abstain in the United Nations. It's not because they're pro-Russian, it's because they've got eyes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. I agree, and I would only add that it, I just despair because, you know, it, the huge population movements in the world have been from agra agrarian areas of the world to urban areas, and only a tiny fraction have been from south to north. And what makes me even more depressed is that we desperately need, like in Scotland, we desperately need immigration because we're an aging population. And our pensions, our pensions depend on, uh, you know, if, if you want to just think about it in terms of pure self-interest, you know, depend on more young people of working age. And yet, the immigration has been caught up in this culture war and we have the deputy leader of the Tory party saying F off back to France. And it's just, it's so, so lamentable to me that we don't have a fact-based, humane discussion of immigration in this country or most of the West. I mean, I think we're coming back to that idea of hypocrisy, which we've touched on, seems to have been a recurring theme. We are approaching the end. Um, can I ask each of you to sum up with one minute um, is the West in decline? What is the West? What is decline? <laughs> <laughs> Academics. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, like for me, I think that's the, the question that I keep asking, you know, um, as an academic, it's true. We do very much uh, like to pick our, our terms. I think that the boundaries of the West are not as clean as we would like them to be. Um, I think decline um, is not necessarily a negative as has been suggested here. Um, but at the same time, a lot of um, deaths by China in Africa, um, most Africans are still speaking English, French, uh, and, and Portuguese. So, you know. Um, difficult question. So I think I would say it's being I mean, it's a very uh, general thing. It's being repositioned to its rightful place okay. in some ways. Um, and I'll say this because, so I, I love the question on sort of whether democracy is working. I think democracy is working if political systems aren't, uh, that we have especially political systems where winner takes all. UK and US prime examples of that. And I, if we transfer that to the global scale of the West in decline, the West was the winner and it was taking it all. But now with the idea of multipolarity, it's not between West or China. It's about sort of how we kind of create a democratic system at a global level, which allows everybody a voice. And I think that requires the West to be repositioned to its more Rightful humble place. place to listen to what others are actually saying. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The West is, uh, if we want to talk about the West in the terms that we outlined at the beginning, at least I did, it's in relative decline. Its share of global wealth is decreasing, which is natural. And its cultural hegemony is likely to recede as well. But this is just part of the natural order of things and not a reason for cultural pessimism or despair. Uh, it's, it's not, some of the other issues we've discussed today, which I didn't expect to discuss, but I'm really glad we did, are issues that, that require, you know, global inequality, uh, the climate, these kinds of things, you know, they, they are a problem. And for them to be remedied in a just way, the West will need to continue to decline in relative terms. 
I've three things to say. Firstly, thank you for coming along today and thank you genuinely for such excellent questions. I've, I've been a really broad ranging discussion and I'm very grateful for your thoughtful contributions. Thank you to uh, Professor Tony Hastrup, to Dr. Matea Peter and to uh, Professor Peter Jackson. Uh, please fill in your surveys. We want to know what you think. You will get them on Eventbrite if you booked online or there are paper copies at the back and you can tell us how to improve the festival. Um, and I can remind you that there are many more events taking place today. There is How to Disagree Agreeably at 1.45, Volunteers in the State at two o'clock. Tomorrow there is In Conversation with broadcaster and former politician Michael Portillo and a lively panel, it says, on the future of Scotland's arts and cultures at five o'clock and another full day of events on Friday. So I hope you can join us and thank you very, very much. <laughs>